In this video, we're going to introduce maximum and minimum values of functions of two variables. So let's say that we've got a graph here of a function. I've got a nice little surface here. Uh, we can define local maxes, local mins, and absolute maxes and mins, much like we do with uh, functions of one variable back in Calculus 1. So just looking at this picture of the surface, we see that we've got a top of a hill here. So that would be what we would consider just by looking at it, a local maximum. We can also look over here. We've got a nice little valley here at the bottom, and we would consider that a local minimum. So making that a little bit more rigorous about what we mean. So we say that a function f of xy has a local maximum. If there is some disk centered at a, b, so here would be the point f of a, b up here. So we're imagining our a, b being down here in the xy plane. We take a disk around that, so some little area around the point A, B. And then if I plug anything in that disk into the function, the function value for that point has to be below, the, or at least no bigger than, the value that we're saying is the maximum value. Right? So this, is, this the idea of putting a disk here is just restricting to an area where we really do have the top of a hill if you will. The function value at that point is what we call the local maximum value. We can define a local minimum in the same way. Over here, we, again, we talk about the bottom of the valley here. We can think about taking a point AB in the XY plane, take a disk around it, just a little area that that's all we're interested in is that little area, and that just happens to be the lowest point for anything that we plug in in that little area. So that's all this is, is just making that a little bit more precise. And then just like before, we would call the output the local minimum value. Now, if you're able to say that, hey, this is the biggest point, the highest point, if you will, for everything in the domain, then really we have an absolute maximum versus a local maximum. And here, notice the way I've got the surface graphed here on the screen this would be an absolute maximum because it's the highest point over the entire domain. And then likewise, we can define an absolute minimum in a similar fashion. This would be the absolute minimum in this case because it's the lowest point for anything that we plug in in the domain. All right, so we can find where these maxes and mins occur, much like what we do in Calculus 1. We just have to worry about the fact that we've got two variables now as opposed to one. So we say that, uh, well, let's say we have a function that is dis differentiable, and we have a max or a min at a particular point. Then it turns out that since it's differentiable, what really had to happen at that point was that we had to have the partials for x and y both be zero. So let's go back and look at this picture. What it's saying here is if we look at this maximum, if we follow this grid line here, notice it tops out and goes back down at that maximum. And notice that the derivative with respect to y at that point would be, actually, I guess that's my x-axis the way I have this uh, graphed. But my derivative would be, um, my derivative would be zero with respect to that direction. Likewise, if I follow this other grid line this way, again, I hit the top and go back down again, my derivative is zero in that direction as well. So I see that my partial with respect to x and my partial with respect to y are both zero in that case. So here again, we uh, look at this particular graph. I notice that my plane here, the tangent plane idea, since both my partial with respect to x and y are zero, my tangent plane is, pl tangent plane is horizontal, much like back in Calc 1 when we had a local max or a local min, the tangent line was horizontal. All right, so given a definition here, if we have a point in the domain of f, we say it's a critical point of f if the partials, both partials at that point are zero or the partial derivatives, one of the partial derivatives doesn't exist at that point. So according to that theorem that we just mentioned before, maxes and mins always occur at critical points, but just because we have a critical point does not guarantee that we have a local max or a local min. Let's look at the function uh, f of xy equals x squared minus y squared. We get a hyperbolic paraboloid in that case. And notice that here with respect to x, we have a derivative of 0 at the origin. 
with respect to x, and with respect to y, we have a derivative with respect to y, or 0 with respect to y for that derivative. So both of the partials are equal to 0 at the origin. However, it's pretty clear from the graph that we do not have a max or a min, much like what we had back in Calc 1. Just because the derivative was 0, we don't necessarily have to have a max or a min at that point. It may have just flattened out and then continued going in the same direction it was when it came to that point. So in this case, we refer to this point as a saddle point for obvious reasons. It looks like you're, if you were imagining sitting here, your legs go this way, your body's this way, you're in the middle of a saddle. All right, so how do we determine whether or not a critical point really does give us a maximum, a minimum, or a saddle point? So what we use here is what's referred to as the second derivatives test for functions of two variables. So let's suppose we have a critical number, or excuse me, a critical point, and that the second partials are continuous on a disk centered at that point. So making sure that we have everything nice and defined here. All right, so I'm going to label some numbers here. So the number A is what you get when you plug in the critical point into the second partial both times with respect to X. B is what you get when you plug AB into the mixed second partial, and C is what you get when you plug in the critical point into the second partial both times with respect to y. And then we calculate this number d, which is ac minus b squared. So we have three possibilities here. Actually, technically we have four possibilities, but three possibilities that we can actually tell what the answer is. So the first possibility is that the number d that you calculate is less than zero. And if that's the case, you get a saddle point. If the d is greater than 0, then you look at the a value. The a value in that case, if, it, if it's less than 0, you get a local maximum. And notice that the a value here is what you're getting for that second partial with respect to x. The a value being negative would say that we would, in terms of the x direction, you have a concave down curve. Well, if it's concave down, that means that you're at the top of a hill. So it must be a maximum in that case. The third case we have is if d is greater than 0 and a is greater than 0, then we really have a local minimum. And again, notice that if we have a is greater than 0, again, a is referring to the second partial with respect to x both times, or the second derivative with respect to x. That says we're concave up, which means that we must be at the bottom of a valley, and so we have a local minimum there. If your d turns out to be 0, much like what you had for the second derivative test back in Calc 1, it's inconclusive. You'd have to do something else to determine whether you have a maximum, a minimum, or a saddle point. All right, so let's see if we can use this theorem to classify our extrema of the function f of xy equals 12x minus x cubed minus 2y squared plus y to the fourth. All right, so the first thing we need to do is figure out where our critical points are. Take our first partial with respect to x, we get 12 minus 3x squared. That factors as negative 3 times x plus 2 times x minus 2. Uh, partial with respect to y is negative 4y plus 4y cubed. Factoring that, we get a negative 4y times y plus 1 times y minus 1. Now remember, we want simultaneously equal to 0. So our x values are zero uh, excuse me the x values that make our first partial with respect to x equal to zero are plus or minus two for the y values that make the the partial with respect to y equal to zero we get zero and plus or minus one but we need them simultaneously zero so i've got a pair two with each of zero one and negative one and i got a pair negative two with each of zero one negative one so that's why we get this list of six critical points in this case making sure we match them all up all right, so to classify these now, uh, this is uh, we need to take our second partials. So our second partial with respect to x is negative 6x. Second partial, mixed second partial is 0. Second partial with respect to y is negative 4 plus 12y squared. We'll click back over just so you can see. Here was our first partial with respect to x. Here's our first partial with respect to y. So you can go back and verify that those really are the second partials. We need to plug in the numbers here. 
when we plug in negative 2, negative 1 into each of these three and calculate our A, B, and C, and then calculate our D, we get D is greater than 0 in that case. And we also see that our A is positive, so that point yields a local minimum. When we put in the point 2, negative 1, we get D is less than 0 in that case, so that means we have a saddle point. put in the point negative 2, 0. We get uh, D is less than 0 again, so we get another saddle point. For the point 2, 0, we get D is greater than 0, and A is less than 0, so we get a local maximum. When we put in negative 2, 1, again we get D is greater than 0, but in this case A is greater than 0 as well, so we get a local minimum. Finally, when we put in the point 2, 1, we get D is less than 0, so we end up with a saddle point. Let's see what this looks like from a graphical perspective. Here's your positive x-axis, here's your positive y-axis, so here are your points 2, negative 1, 2, 0, and 2, 1. We see at 2, uh, negative 1, and 2, 1, we really do get those saddle points because we see it's a maximum in the y direction but a minimum in the x direction likewise over here at the point two zero we really do get a local maximum down here we see local minimum values at um, negative two one and negative two negative one and we see a saddle point at uh, negative two zero Notice that we can see this from the level curves as well. So we had, let's look here, at the point 2, 0, we said we had a local maximum. Notice that we get these, well, ellipses in this case, but these things that look like they're coming to the coming to uh, smaller and smaller circles, if you will. Uh, we also see that at negative 2, 1, and negative 2, negative 1. So when you see these level curves coming into what look like circles that are getting smaller and smaller, or ellipses that are getting smaller and smaller, you're getting a local max or a local min at those points. Notice at the point negative 2, 0, at 2, negative 1, and at 2, 1, we get level curves that cross each other. At those points is where we're getting those saddle points. So again, from we can also investigate graphically where we might have local extrema and might have saddle points by looking at the level curves. Let's switch over to how we would find absolute extrema. Remember that uh, back in Calc 1 when we looked for an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum of a function on an interval, our steps were to find the critical points in, of the function that are in the interval, and then also consider the endpoints. So we do something similar for functions of several variables. We're just extending this up from a notion from a function of one variable to a function of two variables. The boundary, if you will, for a function of one variable when we were doing absolute extrema were the, on a closed interval were the end points. That was the boundary, right? The leftmost point that we had in our interval and the rightmost point in our interval. In two dimensions, of course, our boundary can get a little bit more complicated, but we're still going to look at the boundary as a place where we might get an absolute extreme value. All right, so we have a closed region. Closed region just means it contains all of its boundary points. We're going to find the extreme values much the same way we did for a function of a single variable. So let's do this with examples. So let's say we want to find the maximum and minimum values of f of x, y equals x plus 2y minus x, y over the triangular region. And the vertices are 0, 0, 3, 0, and 0, 6. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the critical points of the function. So our partial with respect to x is 1 minus y. Our partial with respect to y is 2 minus x. It's clear, pretty clear that the only time where this is simultaneously 0 is at the point 2, 1. And you can check now that the point 2, 1 really is in the triangular region d that we defined above. It's important. If the critical number is not in your region that you're interested in, you would throw it out because it can't possibly have the absolute extreme value at that point if that point's not in the region that we're considering. All right, so the next thing we need to do is consider what happens to the function on the boundaries. Well, the triangular region here has boundaries of y equals 0, 
because we're going from the point 0, 0 to 3, 0. It also has a boundary of x equal to 0 because we have a 0, 0 up to 0, 6 is another side of our triangle. The third boundary would be the diagonal line y equals negative 2x plus 6 because that's going from the point uh, 0, 6 to 3, 0. What we do is we're going to plug these boundaries into our function. Remember our function was f of xy equals x plus 2y minus xy. So if we put in the point 0, or x equal to 0 in here, we get just f of, uh, sorry, I think we put in y equal to 0. When we put in y equal to 0, we just get the function f of x, y equals x. That has no critical values. When we put in x equal to 0, we get the function f of x, or excuse me, f of y equals 2y. And notice that these are now functions of one variable because we've replaced one of the variables with a number, in this case with 0. That also has no critical values. When we consider the other boundary, the y equals negative 2x plus 6, we replace the y with negative 2x plus 6. Simplifying, we get the quadratic 2x squared minus 9x plus 1. We take its derivative, set it equal to 0, and find that the x-coordinate is 9 fourths. When we put in 9 fourths in for x, we get 3 halves out for y. It has to be on this point. So we now have a second point at which we might have an absolute max or an absolute min. Finally, the other boundary points we need to consider that we haven't considered so far are the vertices. Those are other boundary points. Those are corners of the region, so we need to plug those in as well. So we, in total, we have a five, or we have five points at which we might get the absolute maximum or absolute minimum. So now at this point, we just plug them into the function and see which one gives us the biggest and which one gives us the smallest values. In this case, we notice that when we put in the point zero, zero, we get as small as possible, we get zero. When we put in the point zero, six, we get 12. That's the biggest we get. So our absolute maximum here is at uh, zero, six, and our absolute minimum is at zero, zero, and the absolute maximum value is 12. The absolute minimum value is zero. And we can see that here's a graph of the surface we can see that we really do get uh, the biggest here at 0, 6 would be over here. That's why we're up really high on the surface. And then at 0, 0, we're at as small as we can possibly be.